the viaduct looms like a bird of doom as a ship and crap where secrets lie in the board of fires and the humming wires yeah man you know you're never coming back across the square across the bridge past the mills past the stack on a gathering storm comes a tall handsome man in a dusty black coat with a red right hand that film last night. No, Either way. Absolute pleasure. Was that your first movie, by the way? No, my second movie. That was your second movie. Second, okay. Second movie. Where, where did you film that? That was... So there's, there's quite an interesting story behind that. I found yeah. a, um, what you probably call an abandoned mill mm -hmm. out in Sunshine. Yeah. When I say abandoned, it was very much no one actually used it. But I found the guy that used it, yep. really trippy little place. He had his own record vinyl pressing place in the back there. Oh, wow. So okay. it was literally me going over a bridge. I saw it. I'm like... It's got to happen. So wait a minute, he's got a vinyl pressing yeah, place in, a, in an abandoned yeah, yeah, yeah. warehouse. Yeah. And you don't need any spe special permits so to, to it's, do it's, that? It's quite interesting. The whole place is his. It's private. I only found okay, out later right. on that the guy owns it. <laughs> um, and I had to shoot there. And essentially I went down there. Yeah. I got in touch. He's got a caretaker that works there. Yeah. And I just I hassled and hassled him for four months. Yeah, wow. It was overseas at the time. And I got in touch. I said, look, you know, I really want to shoot here. Yeah. Mind you, he's had bad experiences with indie films. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Right. So people have they've approached done it. They've approached the past. Some people left a big mess, and so I essentially got him across the line. I said it'll be exactly nine Very days. Very professional. Yeah. Professional nine days. We're in. We're out. Yeah. I had quite a big crew as well. So right. yeah, agreed to it. And I said we got a we got a, a certain place. But the funny bit was the actual script that I wrote for that particular for Whale Away wasn't actually ever meant to be at a mill. It was at a lake house. A lake the, house in the woods. Okay. So, so that he could be kind of isolated, isolated correct. and correct. just as the concentration camps were. Correct. And correct. just, okay, right. Correct, and that was the whole logic. But yep. what, what the funny part was ended up happening was I had everything set up in Tasmania. So I spent six Tassie. months in Tassie. So, okay, so the, the abandoned mill yeah. was where? The abandoned mill was here. Here but in Victoria. It was okay. here in Victoria, but initially the whole project was meant to be done in Tassie. I had a, part, I had a, a co producer up there, we were looking mm -hmm. at setting it all up. At the 11th hour, I had a, one of my investors dropped out, and so did That's Tassie. Crazy. Tassie dropped out. Yeah. But Shooting still, independent film can be just a yeah, headache. Yeah, it's it. after the first one, and then on your second one, it's, yeah, you're yeah. going through that whole ride again, so yeah. I ended up financing it myself. Was it easier for you the second time? I think you learn a lot from, 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 from the first, both financially and both, and just how to get it across the line. Well, what was your first movie called? It was called Frozen Butterflies. Okay, what was that one about? So it's actually kind of, it was closer to home, so yeah. it's more... Closer to home, that's when you lived in Perth? No, that's when I lived here in Melbourne. Okay. So I lived in Melbourne, so it's closer to home in terms of background and in terms of community and stuff like that. So yeah. it pretty much superimposed two parallel stories and never interconnected, but they interconnected based on... I guess kind of this an existential plight that both were going through. So you've got yeah. a Russian Jewish immigrant who's arrived in the country, very well educated. I saw the trailer to that. That's it looks really interesting. Yeah, I want to yeah. see it. Where, where can people go watch it? So that one is uh, that one is probably I would have to show them. Yeah. Um, so that one I kind of kept. It didn't get distribution. It got. Yeah. I did get it screened at the Reunion Island Film Festival. So That's cool. Where I, was that based? In Reunion Island in France. Well, Reunion Island, Reunion Island in France. France. Next right. to Madagascar. It's an island, it's a French colony in Madagascar. Was that part of the Greater Cannes Film Festival? No. Right. No, no. So they're separate. So Whale Away was actually uh, screened at the Cannes Film Market yeah. in 2012. Okay. That's where we shot it. And obviously, you got the Cannes Film Festival, which is all about the glamour, it's all about. Um, but the back end of Khan is a major film market. A lot of yep. deals get uh, cut there. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of cinemas. So I managed to, uh, to screen it there to hop I can imagine it's quite competitive because you're not obviously you're not the only independent filmmaker no, no. there. There's thousands of them. There's a lot of them from all over the world. Correct. How do you? What what kind of things would you 
advise someone or from your own personal experiences being there, how do you kind of stand out and put your hand up and get noticed when you're in an yeah. ocean of, t of people yeah. making movies? So there's probably two ways of doing it. The first thing is before you're even there, there's a lot of groundwork there because, you know, one of the things Make that I do, the communication, set them yeah. up. So I, I think I spent probably for two to three weeks on the yeah. phone from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. Yeah. calling sales agents and distributors saying, I've got a film in Cannes, it's screening. This is the slot that it's screening in. You've got to come see it, etc., etc. Yeah. Et so it's still a lot of groundwork before you even get there. That's crazy. Once you get there, it's all it's all guerrilla. So you've got yeah, we, yeah. we printed out the screening when it was happening. We, Did you make pamphlets and yeah, posters yeah, yeah, and stuff the whole like thing, that? and I would oh, be wow. handing them out, and people would grab them and then walk around the corner. And then what we ended up doing was we had to go back to the bins where yeah, we knew yeah. they would be thrown out, and we had to recycle them that way as well. We kept doing that. Yeah. Well, I, I had the pleasure of watching uh, the second film last night, Whale Away, yes. and. Uh, Pleasure in terms of really well made. I really liked it, but yeah. wow, what a depressing yeah. movie, man! And I'm sure that was the intention. Correct. Yeah. Because yeah, it, it's got a fantastic, very um, grungy, uh, yeah. dark cinematography, yeah. um, a very saturated and stark color palette, yeah. which really gives it an, uh, a very sad and depressing mm. feel. Mm. Um, and, and it's a story essentially about a man who finds out his dying grandfather was a Nazi um, prison guard yeah, yeah. at one of the concentration camps. Correct, yeah. And who, who, just before his death, wrote a diary Correct. that, I don't know, exposes a lot of his past yeah. and what he yeah. did and what he saw and what he participated in Correct. during the Holocaust. Yeah. And what I found fa fascinating about the main character in the film is that he wants to relive mm -hmm. the experiences of victims of that holocaust, yeah. of those concentration camps, for a sense of redemption, to, to redeem himself or his grandfather of the crimes that he committed. Spot on. Uh, so, yeah, I mean... Hi, how you been? Oh, hey. Really how are you? Doing? As you do? Yeah, I'm going to have my usual... Do you need a menu to... Do, um, do you know what you want? Uh, I, I don't. <laughs> oh, it's my first time here. But I've heard good things. It's amazing. I recommend the uh, cheeseburger, Dr. Pepper. Oh, and some and, fries. And fries, but um, the hot dog's really good here as well. There Yeah. Okay. Um, you know what? I'm going to go for the hot dog. Wow. Hot dog. Okay. Yeah. Just, just, this, <laughs> just a plain D-dog, yeah? Yeah. Just yeah. With do you know what? I'll, I'll go the cheeseburger just to try it. Okay, yeah. Give it a go. What are you going to have for a drink? Um, where do you recommend? What would you Dr. recommend? Pepper's, you're okay. sitting right here and you and then a, a parallel version of you Definitely comes up. you have to have an American drink. <laughs> Which one? Dr. Pepper, root beer or a cream soda. Oh, root beer. Yes. Perfect. Like root Sounds beer. good. Thank Thanks for that. Very good. Yeah, sorry. Which is, by the way, you're like spot on. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah. A, it's a really interesting yeah. story because I've never seen anything like that being done in the past. Um, why, what inspired you to make this film and, and why do you feel that um, being the grandson of this monster, that he would want to relive the torture and and put himself in the shoes of the victims that yeah. both died and survived this horror. Yeah, it's a really good question, and I think um, I think it's really interesting that you've you've sort of actually nailed it in terms of your interpretation because when yeah. the film was in. Uh, circulation the circulation yeah. in Japan, they look at it completely differently. Oh, yeah, really? Got a completely they didn't understand on. the context. They didn't get the, didn't get the context. Well, that's, that's right. Well, yeah. But they love that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, I think in a nutshell, there's probably two different sides of it. There's one side of it where, like you mentioned before, the self-redemption piece. Yeah. And that's yeah. all around. Um, he can't ask his grandfather questions because he's dead. So how does he go about, and everyone else is dead, so how can he go about actually finding that self-redemption? It's that self-redemption that he needs as a way out otherwise it has a christ-like subtext to it. it to a degree it yeah. does it has to be, but it's kind of he's got to live it now his whole life knowing yeah, that all yeah. this stuff happened um and it's just the weight that's going to go heavy and heavy with every passing day so what he being a, a film person himself in the context yeah. of the film he says well do you know what i'm gonna i've got this crazy idea and i'm gonna try and relive some of this stuff it's an interesting film and i i I, I like how you don't answer a lot of the questions, no. you keep it open-ended and open for discussion because yeah. one would ask himself why would he go to such an extreme even to wear like the prison uniforms. Right. Uh, if you look at it, the, obviously there's, there's context around, there's historical context around yeah. the theme in, in a sense, but there's always about we see it from a historical point of view in terms of what we read about it. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, that's your drinks. Thank Beautiful. you so much. Dr. Pepper for you. Merci.
Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, a, a lot of it is, it's kind of that sort of, you know, you weren't there, you know that the Americans have dropped the bomb in Hiroshima, but you weren't actually there when no. they dropped the bomb. So you but he's fascinated by the, uh, the, there the psychological Correct. repercussions of, of, of something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was sort of the only way to go through, the only way to actually get it is actually to experience to it. Experience it. Well, yeah. experiencing it, you bring yourself so close to what it Madness. may have, what it, what it was like. And then it's just sort of transcending that sort of that next level. With the third movie that you're making, Sinkhole, mm -hmm. is and it, it hasn't been made. That's in pre-production at the moment. Is so, that right? So th that one's on hold. It's on hold. Yeah, Why is on it on hold? hold? Um, because it's the same sort of scenario. I had stuff set up in New Zealand, so I actually flew over there two years ago. Yeah. Um, looked at locations, looked at trying to get that off the ground, but the budget yeah. that that needs to do it justice, basically, yeah. it's probably a little bit too big. So we're looking at very ambitious. A minimum of. Uh, two and a half to three million wow. dollars to get that one, to give that one what it needs, yep. as well as the marketing. So it's um, the logic was we're going to get that one done, and the one that I was writing at the moment that was going to come afterwards. So yep. this would technically be the fourth one. Um, what do you do, generally speaking, uh, not to divulge any personal information, but uh, what do you personally do generally to get funding for a movie? I mean, three million dollars is a lot of money. It's a lot of cash. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. You, you start, it's like with any kind of story, you've got to start at the very top. You've got to work out when it's essentially um, done right, it's cutting deals. So what yeah. you do is you'd approach a distributor or a sales, mostly sales agents that can act as middle people in order to, to help you come up with that sort of financing. And once mm -hmm. there's interest on board there, then um, based on the New Zealand uh, idea, I was, yeah. logic was maybe possibly using um, the, the, the various uh, ta uh, the various funds available in New Zealand, in Australia, yep. like via the producers rebate back then, all that sort of stuff. But that's quite a complicated um, finance and structure model. Yep. So what I've always defaulted to, you kind of start and seeing what is it possible to do it. Yep. Nine times out of ten, it's too much. It's it's a lot of you know it's it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Put more simply, unless you've got pe serious people backing you. You just have to be quite persistent. So you've got to be persistent, and you've got to be, I, um, I guess, you've got to improvise. So with the last two, it's a lot of... Uh, Do they watch those two movies before they decide? Oh, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, they you, will you, watch. Um, of course. Yeah. You, you've got, you, you're not sort of coming in and saying... You've oh, got like a show reel. And, a, yeah. yeah. No, you're not even a show reel. I've got... Yeah, oh, yeah, to a degree. So at the end of the day, what you probably use is obviously the old indie film model. So yeah. the default model is very much, you, you can't guarantee like people cash up front, so yeah. we put together what are known as, I guess, deferred contracts or contra deals. Mm -hmm. uh, in the event the film does make money down the track, yeah. people possibly get paid. But people look at that the chance of that happening sometimes is slim. Yeah. With the with way other way, in terms of that getting distributed, like I haven't seen a single dollar in my return. Wow. My own loss. So I've, I've had to finance it myself. Right. Oh. There's your hot dog. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, wow. Delicious. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Oh, thank you so much. Cheers. Um, Dig in, dig in, dig in. Um, what's up? Yeah. So, so a lot of it, you're building a lot of it on goodwill, people helping you out, and mm -hmm. at the end of the day, both the films I've made, it's really, I wouldn't have, no way, I would have never got it made if people didn't help. So, there's a lot of people that helped out through the course of the um, production. Tell, tell us about Sinkhole. What's it about, and what? What's so ambitious about it? Um, so, and I've, and I've gone through this a lot, so I've been pitching Sinkhole for a while now, so it's kind of been on hold. So, um, the crux of Sinkhole is um, in the 70s, late mm -hmm. 70s, the Soviet Union was drilling the deepest borehole in the world. It was trying to get as close as it could to the center of the earth. Really? The US was doing the same thing, mm -hmm. um, but in the Soviet Union, they got to close to 12 kilometers into the ground. And like any big project, got abandoned. It got abandoned on the basis of like it was really expensive and didn't sort of do much. Then somewhere in the early to mid nineties, um, there was a Christian radio channel, and it came up with this um, hoax to say that the Soviets drilled into hell. So they drilled, they actually get a cavity, and then they load a microphone down into the cavity, and they heard people screaming, really voices of hell. Mm -hmm. So that spread like wildfires, you can imagine. Really. 
and all that I've never heard about all this. Yeah. This is fascinating. So, because when I watched the trailer, and that's you, so far, you, you've just created a teaser of guys kind of running out of a yeah. door in an open field. Yeah. It's very, um, uh, I don't know, it doesn't reveal anything at all. It's no, just very, it's a yeah, very vague. So this film itself is based on the possibility that a place like that exists. It's mm -hmm. based in the early 80s, it's a period piece. Event Horizon, it kind of sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> and it very much follows um, a group of people making their way, trying to find this this place out of curiosity, but mm -hmm. between where they start in Finland, getting yep. to the Soviet Union, they encounter all sorts of, all sorts of uh, calamities along the way from mm -hmm. Soviet border guards, and then you got creating this kind of evil incarnate that's around. So it's very much it's a heavily it's atmospheric thriller. It's about big spaces. It's about something's out there. It's about stuff going on. People not understanding where it's happening. Yeah. It's about all of that, and that's what Sinkhole essentially is about. That's really cool. I can't wait to see it because uh, it. First of all, I've never heard of this story before, of the hoax mm. and the whole. Um, uh, project that both Russia and America had. I mean, that's that's quite fascinating. Mm. I'll read more into that. So, when do you think there's going to be further development with the film? I think the film is sitting there. So, as so a you're working on something else at the moment? Correct. Right. What's the name of the movie? The one I'm working on now is called <clears throat> Weevil. Weevil. The Project Weevil. It's my take as a film mm. on the old alien abduction um, genre. But okay. I'm, I'm mixing it around. Like a 1950s style? More like early 90s style, like Fire in the Sky. Right, right, right. More, um, okay, abduction. But more, I love Fire in the Sky. But more, Great movie. But more my style, but more a completely different restructuring the whole genre. Uh, kind of like Communion genre. with uh, Christopher Walken? Uh, no, no, I know Communion. Mm -hmm. A little bit different. Okay. So it's kind of, I'm moving away from the traditional sort of subplots around alien abduction. Mm -hmm. Doing something a little bit different. So tell me some of the it's classic horror movie. movies that inspired you. I mean, you've obviously drawn mm -hmm. inspiration from yeah. something. Um, Japanese and Korean movies. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a, an interesting question because um, a lot of um, I'm, I kind of get inspired in a different kind of way. So I don't kind of um, films themselves at certain points in time. There might be certain things in the films that provides a trigger mm -hmm. and I'm automatically I've got like this driving inspiration like 21 grams when I watched that such a good movie I was and again the cinematography in that is it. quite similar to what you correct adopted in your and movie. I watched that film and I went I know how I'm going to do Frozen Butterflies like this is perfect and automatically it just I set off and I even watch movies do you ever months. watch by the same director Amores Peros of course of course it's a masterpiece it's one of my favourite films one of my favourite yeah. films yeah. Yeah. at a particular point in time that were really relevant for me and I you know, 21 grams is a big example for frozen butterflies. Mm -hmm. um, earlier than that, I think drew the majority of my inspiration from. You like when stories kind of intersect? Intersect, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I like the intrigue around stories. I like the fact that yeah. it, it forces you to kind of, like, you've got this an open space, as an example. Like Andre Tarkovsky, one of my favorite directors. Oh, yeah. When Great I watched director. Stalker for the first time, mm -hmm. I was just like, wow using time pressure and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. He also did, um, I think he did Solaris as well. Solaris, yeah. yeah. Correct. So his stuff is really, like, I was speaking a long time ago, this is going back um, to a distributor, mm -hmm. trying to get Frozen Butterflies, trying to get funding. And uh, he asked me the question, he said, Mark, give me an example of what Frozen Butterflies is like as a film. Mm -hmm. So I drew the example of Tarkovsky, and he said, Mark, I went to see it in a film festival in the 80s. And guess what? I was the only one in the cinema. So, it's a masterful film, there's a lot of you know, it is. There's art in there. It attracts a very niche crowd. Though. Very niche crowd. But nowadays, um, the niche crowd doesn't translate to, to business, don't, nor does it translate to sustainability. No, never did, never did. No. So it's art sort of films have always struggled. Correct. And you look at Rolf to her as well, like somebody that starts, like which a good portion of his funding mm -hmm. actually doesn't come from Australia at all. It comes from the specific niche groups in Europe that are interested in that he's kind of... Um, he's but you know, there are a, a, a great many filmmakers who are able to both make an art house film and something which is commercially successful. Right. People like Darren Aronofsky, for example. One of my favourite. Yep. Pie, uh, Requiem, Requiem for, for a Dream, Black Swan, and uh, the, the 
The Wrestler as well. Yep. Great movie. He also did that movie, um, The Fountain. Yeah. Hugh Jackman. Yeah, yeah, Hugh Jackman. Fantastic movie. It's a funny, with The Fountain, he initially had Brad, Brad Pitt and, um, yeah. uh, I forget her name, Naomi Watts fame. Oh, really? And they pulled out. Why did they pull out? Because uh, they were was so famous already by then. Because they're, they're doing Babel. Oh, and they pulled back to do that. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was um, he lost a lot of money, like on that film. Apparently, it didn't make as much as the album was. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. And I don't know he's like, he came from doing Pi, yep. which has spent sixty grand on a big borrowed and steal, like I've done with the last two films. Um, managed to get them to Sundance, got noticed, got picked up, and all of a sudden yep. it's that process. You get noticed, you get picked up, and but then what ended up happening is with the fountain, he kind of reached this peak, this apex, is up there. Um, you could attract actors that be spend ninety million dollars on a movie, mm. and then that wasn't successful. And all of a sudden, in yeah. the industry, people didn't not so much didn't want to touch him, but they're like, oh. So he actually did this. He went, you know, I'm going to go back to my roots. Mm -hmm. I want to do the wrestler. And it's funny, after that point in time, he thought um, the perfect person to do the wrestling was Mickey Rock, whose own career was a little bit is pretty down in the dumps. Mm. So he thought, you know what, he's actually, that was like his comeback. His comeback. He goes, you know, his career's down in the dumps. Um, what I'm thinking might happen is I'll, I really want him to play it. And he had to physically go down and talk to Mickey Rock and sell him the film for him mm -hmm. to do it. Low budget, indie, got the film done, launched him back up. And I think the reason why Mickey, Mickey Rock back up as well. When I, because um, I did, went to Khan with my colleague and we, like, we financed ourselves. We got there, we paid for everything ourselves. Yep. Um, and when I got, when you're starting out, you have to. You've got to do it all yourself. Absolutely. But, but then all my, <coughs> then the, the um, Screen Australia, mm. they noticed that and an Australian producer, filmmaker, has got a film at screening and the Khan film market, etc. Et all of a sudden, I get, a, <coughs> I get an invitation to their Australian Australia's party. And they've got like oh, wow. Movie. Okay. There was a lot of individuals there that as soon as you talk to them and they said, so, um, how, you know, what's your name and what do you do? And you've got, a, you've got a space of 10 seconds to work out how important you are and whether it's worth speaking here or shifting focus and speaking to someone else. Oh, really? So I found out that that, that, that was a flavour of it. That's um, crazy. Space. But it's a good flavour because it gives you a very solid understanding of where you want to be and where you don't want to be. So I picture myself doing what I want to be. Maybe one day down the track, yeah, yeah, I'll be one of those. You've got your vision. One of my old, one of my old colleagues and his old partner in crime and film, yeah. he always, he always used to say to me, that, um, the path that I'm taking is uncharted. And usually the uncharted paths, the less defined ones, are the hardest. Yeah. But they're the ones that anything's possible. You can, you know, you can start here and then all of a sudden end up somewhere else. And it works the other way around as well. So when can we expect to see your next movie? Okay. I mean, do you have a, a plan? Uh, I do. I think. I think with going back to what I was saying before, there's no predefined way. If I had somebody who was going to back it tomorrow, mm -hmm. I could say, do you know what? It'll probably take me six months to get all wrapped up. Mm -hmm. Further, come a couple more months in post to you know do all this. So probably twelve months. Mm -hmm. But I can't even say that. All I can say is that you'll eventually see it. When? God knows. And what do you do in the meantime? while you make movies, in between making movies? Um, so I'm in, um, I work in, in, in HR. Yeah. So that's my kind of, that's my kind of Clark Kent gig. And like so many of us, the only time you really have to work on a movie is after work. Unfortunately. You know, you're, you're so tired by the time you come home. One kind of supports the other. Yeah. Um, uh, those creative, mm. what's juices. the word? Juices, yeah. The creative yeah. juices are not flowing. Yeah. The best way to do it, I mean, I've, I've adopted a, in the past, I would write, I would sit down and I would yeah. have a momentum. I'm like, right, no, this is going, no, this is going. Yeah. Now, the most effective way to do it is dedicate yourself 10 to 15 minutes a day. Yeah. And if it ever comes, go for it. I find if, that if it doesn't, don't. The way to look at it, don't put too much pressure on yourself if you yeah. are writing, if you, you're trying to find. Like a lot of people. Are like, it will come back eventually it'll, anyway. It'll, it'll that, come that back. Feeling. But, but everyone's, everyone says, well, look at your story arts. At yeah. the end of the day, you've got to, you've got to, it's immersive. The whole exactly. process is immersive. Yeah. My rule of thumb is, my yeah. advice is, if you're not immersing yourself into it, you're just writing. You're yeah. not actually writing. So you're pretty much, you're describing versus writing. Writing is really, you're immersed in it. Absolutely. And when you're writing it, you put yourself in the headspace and you start feeling some of this stuff. And it's just, it's not even about the script you're writing, it's about the process that you're, the emotional process that you're going through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what happens to be, at the end, the outcome happens to be a script. Yeah. Or a book. And then you go, shit, where did that come from? <laughs>